Welcome to the midterm student uh, team project presentation. Uh, we don't have time for questions or comments. I know we had a great time at the VA, so we'll talk about that on Tuesday. A uh, couple um, just reminders to fill out the uh, attendance form, and plus we have an um, evaluation sheet. Everybody fills out an evaluation sheet. Is, is there anybody that doesn't have one? Okay, great. So that's what it looks like. So make sure you fill it out legibly in pen. Uh, pencil doesn't Xerox very well. This is very important information because it's sent back to the students as feedback on their presentations. So it's not just me that's evaluating these presentations, everybody. But you know, don't evaluate your own presentation. Leave that to others, okay? So no micro writing either. So use a pen that has large font and legible font, okay? That's important. Um, so everybody has sent me their PowerPoints, thank goodness, and uh, so everybody will have uh, eight minutes and we'll have a time for a couple questions. I want to remind the students that their midterm reports are due on Tuesday. All you have to do is uh, send, send it to me in an email in either Word format or PDF format, and I'll start um, looking them over. If you have any questions about <coughs> about the report, um, you know, referred to the uh, assignment um, handout that you got on the first day of class or, or the one that's online. Okay, so next Tuesday, uh, we're gonna have um, Terry Adams here. She's uh, an associate director of the Office of Accessible Education, but she's not gonna be talking about her office. She's gonna be talking about universal design concepts and also the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley. So um, that ought to be a very interesting uh, talk. So please be around for that. So we have eight teams today, and this is the order. And uh, we're going to start with the caffeinator. So come on up. like and on the left is what his looks like. So he has a couple of problems. Um, mostly that his knee joint is very unstable and that he can't, he has, he's a bad valgus problem, which is um, where you have knock knees basically. So his right knee kind of can't inwards and it gets really weird when he starts bending his leg especially. Um, it starts to kind of rotate out as he bends it more and more. So he has a couple of, he has an existing brace and actually several existing braces so that he can deal with, you know, everyday kind of activities to, to walk around, to do whatever sports, to do all the, the things he does. Um, but he wanted some kind of assist for his knee extension because he's also missing two of his quads. Um, so that's our, our task. Um, and he's ridiculously active, like it's, it makes me feel really terrible about, about myself sometimes that he like has this really messed up leg and like he's done CrossFit, he snowboards, he sent us videos of him like snowboarding with no pants on so we can like see his leg moving and like, understand exactly how it works. Um, so he's he's really looking for something that helps him you know, run faster, jump higher, lift heavier, um, snowboard for longer, um, and that's what we've been prototyping on for the last couple weeks. 
All right, so uh, from the outset, we <coughs> tried to narrow down our project goals, and these are some of the goals we had. Um, first and foremost, we wanted to just give some sort of assistance to the knee extension movement. Um, we simplified that by um, narrowing it down to just um, having the foot resting against the floor. So instead of having to assist it while the foot was in mid-air, we had it braced against the floor. Um, another one was just simplicity, just because it's a quarter-long project and we knew that it could get complicated really fast and we wouldn't finish. Um, and cosmesis is also another one of our important goals. Um, so for inspiration, we looked at the EXO, obviously, um, but we realized that this would be too complicated just given the amount of like electrical components and sensors and whatnot that there were on it. So we looked at this, which is the Bartlett tendon. Um, it basically has a custom polyurethane band around it to uh, um, give the assistance. Um, so we took that as inspiration and went into prototyping. Yeah, so the, the basic concept of it is that there's some kind of elastic band that stretches from the, from the thigh across the knee at a sort of pulley joint thing uh, and is attached to the lower leg. So as it stretches out, um, it kind of resists the, the flexion more and more and provides assist when you extend the leg. Um, so our first extremely quick and dirty prototype was doing basically that with rubber bands and binder clips and bailing wire in 36. Um, and we got, we got kind of it was a little bit too low resolution to, to really get us much assist at all, and we, we kind of discovered that there's some geometrical problems with having, instead of having a pulley like in our later prototypes, we had two little uprights that as they would kind of come apart, eventually they would lock back into flexion, so you could get, end up locked like with your knee bend, which was exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, so we, we picked up this, this pulley approach like the, the Bartlett tendon um, and found some bungee cords sitting around the shop. Um, yep. and kind of wedged them between the, the kind of frame rail upright uh, of a brace that Max loaned us for, for the duration of the quarter. Um, yeah, our next round was to uh, try to make it so that we could attach it to both his current brace and the one that we had, so we made these also really quick metal pieces. One of the biggest takeaways there was that this is actually going on a person, so we should like file down the corners. Um, but we also just like tuned down the pulley system and also doubled up the bungee cords and now it has like a pretty significant kicking force. And we, so the kind of our next move is to try and find a material that works better than bungee cords, which is actually, we've been kind of trying to salvage things from, you know, Home Depot and random kind of parts we have laying around. So we found like a rubber tie down that you'd use for tying stuff down in the truck, um, which was, we, we were hoping was going to give us way more assist than we had been getting with the, the bungee cords, but it kind of ended up being about comparable. So we were going to end up testing a lot of different materials, I think, and, and <coughs> probably our next step is figuring out how to kind of scale these <coughs> um, materials wise to get it to actually work. So as Marshall started mentioning, some of our goals now are to optimize our current design. So that means um, like trying to figure out what the best material is and trying to dial down the movement. Um, also, we modified some of our goals. Now our main goals are adjustability, so the ability for the user to adjust how much tension there is in the force, and also um, to be able to turn it on and off, so being able to like unhook it if you're walking and like hook it back up if you're like snowboarding or weightlifting and stuff. And we're, we're going down to visit the uh, UCSF folks that actually work with Max for his, his brace that he wears every day and the, the brace that we're kind of modifying is like sports specific brace um, and hoping to get some, some feedback from them and some, some input especially on maybe the material side because they work with a lot of kind of crazy carbon fiber rubber things that we don't really necessarily have access to um, and we, we went and talked to Gary Burke actually right before he came and gave his lecture um, and he gave us a lot of perspective on the, the human side of things and how, you know, as mechanical engineers we kind of think, oh, we need to apply this force here and this will increase our torque and the elasticity of the materials is really important and all of that, but really, like, the things that were most important in some of our prototypes were, like, we really need to file down all of the edges where it will, like, cut through straps on the brace or, like, you know, nick you if you're trying to adjust something. 
um, kind of working with the usability and making it not so kind of complex to adjust that it's really impossible, um, which was something we were kind of running into. And we had a ton of different degrees of adjustment in the first couple of prototypes. Yeah. And then getting, getting kind of testing different materials is also on the list, like doing some. Actually, get, actually getting numbers is also on that list, um, just because we've been looking at kind of qualitatively what the kicking looks like, but we want to actually put numbers to it to get accurate comparisons. But that's about it. Cool. OK, we have uh, time for some questions. Questions on that question? Uh, Alexander has a question. Um, with testing adjustment, you see something you ran into, you can degrees of freedom problems um, of, of too many adjustments um, kind of moving along that line. Have you gotten to a prototype stage yet where, where you get to try to see whether, uh, or actually maybe if you define early on, are, are you angling for adjustment wall wary or adjustment wall off only? Um, I mean, ideally, adjustment while wearing. Like, uh, ideally, you like hit a lever or something, and or like unhook something, and it's off. You know, so so that when he's you know like walking around or running or something, and then wants to sit down, it's not like he has to work really hard to bend his leg to, to like sit down at 90 degrees. Yeah, for um, this one, there's like there's two metal blocks there's a there. There's a point around that. What? Um, oh, that, that green vertical thing. Ah, okay. <laughs> These two metal blocks are um, held in by a screw, and you can just like tighten them down, and then just like slide them along the brace if necessary. Um, obviously, not that robust, but it was it was kind of like our proof of we can make this adjustable on this axis. Yeah. So ideally, adjustable whenever. At the moment, it's a little bit cantankerous to adjust to, like when it's actually on someone. But yeah. Max has actually tested it on himself, and that's where all of our prototypes are right now. Yeah. I mean, on you, on you guys. Oh. So, the brace he gave us is from when he was like 14 or something, so it doesn't actually fit on either of us. It kind um, of fits me. It almost fits me. <laughs> but, um, and his current brace, he doesn't like, I mean, we, I guess we could. The problem is, I think that it's. Since his knee geometry is really like his his leg size is very like his, his right leg is really small and like the geometry is really weird, it would probably be like there. I don't, I don't even know whether it would be comfortable for one of us. Like I don't I don't know how helpful it yeah. would be for us to wear. I don't know. We can ask him. We can <laughs> ask. But I, like him, he we gave him some of our prototypes and he like put them on his brace and like wore them around for a day, and which was just like. What kind of, are you doing? Yeah, pretty, pretty <laughs> incredible to get that much feedback that early, and we got like a lot of useful things out of that. Um, but I th every week we kind of give him something new, and he slaps it, it on and, and tests it out. Yeah, yeah, tries to break it best he can. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> That's Zeppelin. Lab Zeppelin, um, and we uh, are doing a project this quarter on enhanced visibility. And uh, I'm Justin, uh, I'm a senior, we're doing uh, mechanical engineering. I walked in, second year master's here, mechanical engineering as well. I'm Sarah, I'm a junior in mechanical engineering. Um, so, how many of you guys had uh, heard of a uh, wheel before they came? <laughs> Okay, I wasn't sure about that, but um, I think it, it, it'd be a good time to just talk a little bit about the product itself. So Wheel is basically a really, really awesome, high-tech, um, a personal mobility device. That's how they're actually marketing it because, uh, well, the, only the FDA can actually say that, you know, you can use it as a wheelchair. But anyways, it's an um, all-wheel drive. It has uh, omni-wheels in the front, so it has a really, really tight um, uh, turning radius compared to other power chairs. And uh, in general, it has a really great design aesthetic, and it's won a lot of awards. 
Um, so basically, this is uh, how they started out. So um, basically, a, a group of friends um, uh, basically started um, in Japan. They, uh, they, they, they wanted to make something for one of their, uh, uh, their friends in the wheelchair. So they actually started out um, with making kind of an attachment to a manual chair. So um, after testing it out, they actually realized they were getting a lot, they were kind of hitting onto something because a lot of people gave them really great feedback about, you know, uh, they, how they really loved the design aesthetic, how, you know, how well it worked for them. And uh, basically they decided to uh, put their, their jobs, you know, at the time they were working for uh, big companies like Sony, Nissan, and uh, as designers, and they decided to work full time on this project. And so um, ever since then, the company has really took, uh, taken off really quickly. It's not exactly like uh, Snapchat or Instagram, but you know, it's uh, received a lot of uh, critical acclaim from um, high-tech blogs like The Verge, uh, from Wall Street Journal, and uh, basically they've uh, even shown it at, uh, the, at the recent uh, Consumer Electronics Expo. So um, with all that in mind, uh, what, what is there for us to do? It seems like, you know, um, the wheel has had a lot of development and, you know, it looks like a great product. But there's actually a lot of problems uh, that, uh, that um, wheel is and their t uh, team of engineers are trying to uh, work out. And so uh, one of them is uh, something that Fernanda uh, brought up uh, to us in class, and that is that uh, problem of visibility. Uh, and so, just like, this is uh, the corner of uh, Octavia and uh, Market Street uh, in San Francisco. And uh, basically, it looks, you know, like it's uh, perfectly safe you know, during the day. But at the night, look at how many uh, cars are moving around. This is actually one of the most uh, dangerous corners in uh, San Francisco. There have been uh, 30 accidents uh, from 2009 to, to 2011 um, of uh, in incidences of uh, cars hitting pedestrians. And so uh, recently, uh, there's been a new, uh, there was a lot, of, there was a tragedy where basically uh, one person in a wheelchair um, who was an advocate for uh, wheelchair safety and public uh, visibility and he uh, tragically lost his life because uh, he uh, was out that one night and a car hit him. So um, what we want to do wheel, is basically tackle this problem and uh, make sure that this product revolutionizes not just the power chair uh, industry but also uh, tackles and addresses problems that maybe people haven't uh, really seen before. Uh, for this industry. So one thing that we wanted to do was to ensure that wheelchair users can travel safely at night and secondly ensure that drivers themselves are able to see uh, wheelchair users um, whenever the wheel is out. Um. All right, so keeping those uh, needs in mind, we started brainstorming. Um, a lot of our designs sort of overlapped with each other and we found out that uh, we had two different ideas and concepts of visibility. The first one was for the user, for the user to be able to see at night. And the second one was for the user to be able to be seen by other people at night. We got a lot of inspiration from products that are already out on the market, like bike lights. Um, bikes also have this problem of being not very visible at night, and so there are a lot of cool products out there. Um, we also sort of modeled uh, our initial designs to throw it back to the very first model of wheel we thought it would be kind of cool. And going through this brainstorming and sketching process, we also realized some of the limitations we had with the current product. Uh, for example, we really wanted to have uh, sort of lighting on this back panel um, to be able to uh, let the user be seen from behind. Um, but it turns out that this back panel is used for uh, hanging backpacks and bags. And so um, we really wanted to redesign that so it wouldn't be limited in that way. So now we're thinking of um, having the backlighting be more on the side of the side wheel. Um, what was really cool is that we got a chance to visit Wheel. Um, and we talked to a couple of their engineers there and got a chance to um, we got a chance to take a look into their design decisions and why they made um, certain uh, aesthetic decisions. And we got to see a lot of scrap parts um, and previous models that were taken apart, which was really cool and really helped our design process. And so taking all that in mind, we moved forward to three main design goals. The first one is illumination, um, and this targets um, having the wheelchair user be able to see their path at night. Uh, and so we want to focus on forward illumination and we want to be able to do this 
by uh, placing white LEDs on the sides of the armchair. Um, and so you would be able to see uh, your immediate foreground and several feet ahead of you. The second design goal is visibility, uh, being able to be seen. And so we want to create a form outline on the side panels of the wheelchair. Um, and this is to um, be more recognizable at night. And so we want a futuristic and cool design, but we also don't want it to be too distracting uh, because that could uh, be sort of dangerous for you and whoever's driving um, or biking past. Uh, and so we're currently looking at two different design concepts, uh, this first one over here and then the bottom one. And we also want it to be really cool. Uh, so we are integrating an automatic light sensor that turns on when it's dark and turns off when, you walk, uh, when it's daylight or you walk into a lighted room. And we also want to integrate it with Wheel's unique design. Uh, and we also want to incorporate a light show so you could change the various colors of the LEDs whenever you want. So we've been prototyping our current design idea, and we're working with uh, these RGB LED strips that are really useful and handy to work with. We've got like five meters of lights per strip, and we have like, a bunch of LEDs on each one, so we have uh, a lot of cool stuff to play with, luckily. I'm going to skip this video, but it's just one of our explorations that we're doing some backlighting in the panels of the actual sides of the wheel product. But we've decided to move the lights onto the outsides, actually, onto two kind of arcs on the front and the back. This is our current prototype right now. Which is laser back now. Yeah, this is the current pr prototype. We have an arc on the back here of RGB LEDs and an arc on the front. These are both connected to each other and will be illuminated in the same color. Um, on the top of the armrest, we have a strip of white LEDs um, for a nice bright headlight to see forward with. And on the side here, we have <coughs> all of these things along with our power source, power source which, which is a battery. Just um, so the current prototype idea we have right now. We're going to work on making it um, more fleshed out using the processes later on. Uh, but anyways, some Velcro stitching is holding on right now on the sides. Uh, basic overview electronics, uh, pretty simple circuit actually. Um, got some auto sensing for light levels, which is cool. And this is what it's like at night. We can change the colors of the side panels for the RGB LEDs um, independently and get individual colors of red, green, also blue. And we can also combine those to get kind of white headlights on the side as well, which is pretty nice. So, where we're at right now. I got a question. Do you think those front-facing LEDs will actually provide enough illumination, maybe comparable to what you get on a, on a bike? Like, have you tried that? Yeah, right we I tested the headlight part of it at night uh, a couple nights ago, actually, and it's really bright oh. with um, just those lights I can see on there right now. Um, it illuminated like a very nice field in front of you. That would be good for a wheelchair, I think. I'm oh, sorry. Alexander? Back, but, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about illumination in the back? I'm worried when I'm traveling down the street because uh, I can see the front and the side. Yeah, so actually, if you look at the bottom, or these two pictures actually, there's a strip kind of on the front edge of the wheel hub, and there's a similar strip on the back edge of the wheel hub as well. Um, and the second strip kind of comes on the side to give you the side illumination, but we're definitely having lights on both the front and back edges of those wheel hubs, and some side lighting as well. How did you say they're powered? Uh, this is powered off a battery. Um, wheelchair battery? It will be in the end, but we can't. We don't have access to the actual wheelchair's power source right now, so we're using our own battery to unmet that. Anybody else? Yeah, are you guys using anything as kind of a metric to track improvements from visibility before visibility after, or? We're going to, I think, check out the current little product and take pictures of it at night and see how visible it seems uh, crossing the street. And then put our lights on it and see how it changes and how much more visible we think it is and any improvements we think we might need to make uh, after that. One more question. Uh, as a final product, do you envision this as something that uh, a wheel user would sort of buy an accessory, so to speak, or something that would be built into the uh, So the idea is to actually integrate this into their um, next gen design. And so we want to actually um, uh, vacuum form copies of these panels that are clear and then put these lights behind these clear panels on the sides of the actual body panels of the wheelchair. Okay, great job guys. Disability <laughs> Heroes.
Are you ready? Okay, go. Hi, we're the Disability Heroes, and we are working on an educational design kit for children with disabilities. I'm Alessia. I'm John B. And I'm Cassie Janica. So, uh, the resource area for teaching, RAFT, creates innovative hands-on educational activity kits which are used by 12,000 educators to help over 1 million um, K-12 through students master important educational concepts and work skills. These kits are particularly popular with many educators because they seem to open up students with physical, mental, or emotional disabilities and get them excited about learning and participating. So this is us on our field trip to RAFT. On the left is Greg, our host, and who's been helping us throughout our project. And on the right is a picture of some of the bulk bins, which are low-cost materials, and there's these huge bins filled with like bottle caps or um, uh, <coughs> corks. And Here's John Hobby and I at, uh, with the, the bulk bins. So there, there's this huge space with a bunch of these things, and there's it's a bunch of low-cost material, and it's everything we could ask for and more. Um, here is an example of an existing educational kit. Um, it's called the Rollaway Can. Very, uh, I mean, it's just two plates, plastic, plastic container, and uh, some metal. Uh, things and um, a rubber band, thank you. And all it does is that you roll it and then it rolls back to you. Um, it's it's a great fun activity, but it's very it's a close-ended one. That's all it does. So we're trying to come up with something that would be better than this. And the goal for the top of the statement is basically to create one of these educational design kits, but create one that's more open-ended and really tailor it more for students with disabilities. The goal of our specific project is to focus on students with physical disabilities. Next slide. We also have to meet the following design criteria. The three most important are that it promotes learning, teamwork, and creative thinking. It's cost effective. Um, teachers sometimes have 35, 40 students in their class, so money is a big issue, as well as address the disabilities of the students. Next slide. We went through the design thinking process to figure out our idea. We did a brainstorm of over 40 ideas, narrowed it down to our top 10, got feedback from Dave and Greg. Next slide. Created a matrix um, to rank according to the different criteria. As you can see, we have our 10 ideas on the side, and we came up with our top three. Next slide. So the three ideas that we narrowed it down to were making square wheels roll, interaction of light with a CD, and a sundial. So the idea between square wheels was um, to provide the students with a wheel that's not um, that's not conventionally used um, and have them come up with a surface that would enable the wheel to roll smoothly. Now we all know that square wheels aren't really a thing, but the idea was this would encourage them to sort of embrace the brainstorming and collaborative process um, and teach them a bit about rapid prototyping and how it's more important to test things than to just like conceptualize them in your head. Um, in terms of uh, teaching material, we thought that this would be a really good opportunity for teachers to incorporate things like trigonometry if they have triangular wheels later on um, and other interesting sort of scientific methods. So the teaching plan would include that and also um, the ability to recognize and create patterns and be able to sort of find ways in which um, different components can fit together to achieve a common goal. And finally, the cost. Um, we use bottle corks and plastic sheet, extremely low cost items. Uh, our second prototype was uh, the interaction of light uh, with CD. Um, basically, very low cost. We used just three CDs and like put the stack them up on a uh, CD case and put a pencil in between so they stay up. And because it was raining that day, um, I just used a flashlight and just showed it on my uh, my wall. Um, so, uh, so it promotes uh, learning, teamwork, and creative thinking. Um, it teaches art and science, obviously, because it's about uh, light and reflection. Um, the teaching plan includes like the scientific method, because it's uh, so here, like the CD kind of acts, um, acts like a prism, a mirror, and the activity consists of tilting it to make um, various rainbows. Um, the design too, and the cost, of course, like low cost. Like as I said, it was just three CDs, one CD case, small pencil, and you can just go outside and do it with the sunlight and use like a sheet of paper to. <coughs> And our final prototype is the sundial. This promotes creativity. As you can see, there's a couple different types of sundials you can make, and there's another one besides this, so students can be a little bit more creative and have different projects. Next slide. In addition,
education, it explores quite a few academic concepts. Interpolation helps them learn about math, learning about the earth and the sun and their relationship in science. History through history of timekeeping and design, which promotes engineering, of course. And this again uses low cost bulk fit items. We have um, bottle lids, ports, CDs, paper, or CD holder and paper. Next slide. All three projects kind of converged on the physical disability, and our goal was to have them all address these points. So they're all usable by someone missing an upper extremity. The sundials can actually be created using just your elbow if needed. Uh, next is limited motor control. Most things can be pushed into place, and the rolling square wheels can actually have a handle to help children grasp a little bit easier. And finally, limited physical strength. So everything is lightweight and doesn't really require physical force. So, um, in order to really flesh the prototypes out, we also met with Ms. Eve Sutton, who was a classroom teacher and is now an individual consultant for children with disabilities. With prototype one, she said, she commented on how square wheels aren't really a real world application. Um, but she also said, she told us to focus on the fact that it was a collaborative project. Um, with prototype two, she reminded us that Roth actually already has um, ways of talking about prisons um, and even sells in expensive prisons. But she told us to focus on why a CD specifically creates rainbows um, and have like tie in the construction and function of a CD into our teaching plan. With Project 3, she reminded us that classrooms actually have multiple overhead lights, which, uh, which obviously throws off the point of the sundial, and so we'd have to either use a very focused light or go outdoors. Um, she also suggested making more additional markers, um, but she said if we give the students a tangible goal, then this is um, a pretty great idea. Um, so here's our road plan. Um, the three challenges we foresee are completing additional interviews, not just from another teacher, but also from parents, um, maybe even a student with disability, if they're willing. Um, hopefully um, ensure applicability of our final product to multiple ages and multiple classes. Um, have the teaching plan be flexible and flexible across multiple ages. And um, we hope by week nine to have finalized on a product, incorporate our interview feedbacks, and work on our final report. Thank you. And these are work cited if you guys are interested. Any questions? I really like the uh, sundial picture because it had both an hour hand and a minute hand. So that's really unique. Yeah, that one down the right. Look at that one. That's beautiful. <laughs> First time I sundial I've seen to do that. Any other questions? Just how large are the teams? Sorry? Uh, how large are the teams? Oh, students? Yeah, it's typically going to be teams of three years, I think. That's a good number to promote teamwork. But there's going to be several teams in the classroom because, like I said, the classes can get really big. Um, any other questions, comments? <coughs> that was really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Our recent entertainment. So my name is Michael, uh, this is Andrea, and this is Suki, and together we are Forest Entertainment. Our project for the quarter is to design a stroke therapy game that is both engaging and motivating uh, for patients. <clears throat> so, uh, let me just walk you through the structure of our presentation. First we're going to talk about uh, the problem statement and user research, and then we're going to discuss the uh, design process. Uh, and finally we'll uh, discuss the expected costs and then where we're going to move on from here. So the problem statement. In the United States, there are two-thirds of stroke patients require physical or occupational therapy. Although sessions can be productive, the pro recovery process can be very slow. For this reason, therapists recommend that patients take home exercises um, and do these uh, on a regular basis um, in order to maintain and encourage the progress that's made during um, these therapy sessions. Yet, uh, patients find it difficult to adhere to some of these take-home regimens. Uh, from this, we identified three main problem statements, um, uh, being, first of all, that exercises are repetitive and uh, need to be coupled with extrinsic motivation. Second, that uh, non-adherence is a major barrier to recovery. And finally, that progress can be very slow and sometimes difficult to track. 
So, like Mike mentioned, many people become discouraged once they leave the structured therapy environment and head home to practice on their own. So we decided to gear our project towards these people. These people might not have insurance that covers extensive therapy, they might not be willing to leave the comfort of their home, or they might not have the time or support needed to get to a therapy facility. So we're designing for adults who are recovering from a stroke, whether or not they are new to therapy or if they have been participating in it for years. <coughs> Before beginning, we spoke to Eric and Debbie, who both helped us um, learn a lot more about stroke therapy and what already exists out there. We learned a lot about the limitations, mainly motivation issues, in existing therapy strategies. But regardless of who we spoke to, we learned one thing that everyone seemed to agree with. Repetition and um, practice are key to success in continuing recovery. So from here, we decided to explore, we started to explore what product we would actually design. There was an extensive brainstorming process where we researched what was already on the market that utilized virtual gaming techniques. We found that these labs implemented games that were still in isolated settings or maybe required a therapist to help, usually utilizing technology such as the Kinect. The issue with this is it doesn't address the problem of motivation on an everyday basis. And so we came up with the idea of gamifying everyday life. This means that instead of having to hook up to a connect or go through a process with a therapist, the functions of everyday life such as walking would be incorporated into posture-based therapy and incorporated into a game. Gamifying everyday life for us has two components. First is a hardware component, um, so something electronic that will actually measure the posture and how many times someone is in correct posture. And second is a software component that would use correct posture to accrue points towards accomplishing goals in a game. We toyed with a lot of different ways of making this work and spent a lot of time actually on devices that didn't end up fulfilling their purpose. So we played a lot with the Mayo armband and ultimately concluded that it simply was not sensitive enough to pick up on the different hand movements of someone with a stroke, which is why we pivoted towards um, posture-based therapy. When we looked at things like the leap motion, um, we also found that it didn't have the wireless capability that would be necessary to easily gamify everyday things. You would have to actually be sitting down at a computer. So now let's talk about some of the decisions that we've actually made in the context of the project. Um, on a software level, we've decided to go with a game that emulates, you remember we all had Tamagotchis growing up? That kind of experience, a companion that would grow with you as your progress goes. And to externalize motivation, we'll actually uh, link progress of your Tamagotchi or companion to a grandchild or family member uh, so that you progressing in your game or the stroke progression progressing in their game is linked to someone else who can help keep them on track. This would require a couple of things from a data perspective. We want quick access to the data and have, it to e have multiple users access to the same database, which is why we decided to go with a SQL-based uh, database that holds everything in a relational table for efficient access to the data. And from a front-end perspective, we're making all of our graphics original from scratch on Illustrator. Um, and after talking to Eric, we'll either be using a Java engine or HTML and CSS for an in-browser experience. Uh, here you can see we made this all by ourselves on Illustrator. It's the first mock-up of the game. So we have uh, a sprite right here that will actually evolve as this progress bar fills up, uh, probably with an animation of feed, food filling up. And it will grow so that you can play games with you and also play games with the grandchild. Uh, so that motivation is two uh, people using the same game and growing together. So while Suki was working on the software aspects, Mike and I worked on the hardware. We started with the Arduino Micro, but quickly realized it wasn't able to process the data that we needed it to. So we switched to the Uno which was able to get the data that we needed. Um, we connected it to the MPU 6050, which contains a gyroscope and accelerometer, and quickly learned that um, the data it collects is numerical, so it just gives you a streaming list of numbers that is really hard to conceptualize. Um, if we could let this video. Oh. Okay. And so we moved to a 3D model that allowed us to like see what the gyroscope was actually doing. And this was really helpful to us in terms of determining balance and posture. Um, okay, so <laughs> it's, it's really just showing um, a 3D model of what the actual position of the gyroscope is. And this is really helpful to us in terms of being able to visualize what's happening because we learned early on that hand motions were really hard to um, read based on this, so we switched to a posture. <laughs> so as you can see, the way it tilts would be the way that a human is tilting back and forth and allows us to really visualize that as well. 
Um, so let's talk about the cost that we've incurred so far and where we're going to take it from here. Um, so far, we've spent about $80 um, on mainly on the hardware uh, component of our project. Um, and uh, namely, this includes uh, the various sensors that we used and incorporated and the different Arduino boards that we used as well. Um, where we're going to take it from here, we hope to incorporate this into um, a wearable so that a wearable device so that we can actually uh, really incorporate this whole um, game experience into your daily life. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second, but um, sorry, back a little bit. <laughs> um, we're also considering uh, incorporating uh, long flex bend sensors uh, or a lily pad Arduino board. Um, lily pad Arduino board is the same thing as a normal Arduino board except that it can be uh, sewn onto uh, textiles. Um, and we expect that the overall cost of our project won't exceed um, $170 out of the $200 budget that we um, are allocated. So from here, uh, here are a couple of the designs, uh, just quick sketches of, of what we, um, uh, of some of the concepts that we're exploring uh, in terms of incorporating our sensors into a wearable device. Um, so we're looking at uh, items that you would wear every single day uh, that don't, uh, don't feel cumbersome, that aren't extra, uh, extra weight, extra uh, in terms of uh, your mobility, they don't like um, block your mobility. So things like a belt, things like a hat, even a jacket where we can sew something like the lily pad Arduino sensor, uh, Arduino board, sorry, onto the back of the, the back, mainly the upper half of the body so that we can detect posture accurately. Uh, so to summarize our next steps moving forward are to, from a technical perspective, to actually go ahead and secure the mounting. We have all the electronics figured out, but we want to now mount it onto the hat or the belt that you just saw sketches of. Uh, the, right now it has to be plugged into a computer, so we want to enable it wirelessly, and we'll also move on to user testing just shortly. Question? Yeah, so you one thing that I thought was really, really good about your design is that uh, it grows with uh, the user, so the user can be continually challenged. That's always an issue if you have the same thing and you work, work playing the same game every day, it's going to get boring. So the ability to have it uh, uh, change and continue to challenge the user is really important. One of the things we wanted to incorporate uh, especially was the motivation component, and so um, the, uh, the way that you accrue points also unlocks uh, the uh, different levels and different games for other people. Um, and so that's also one thing that we're exploring, uh, uh, unlocking games for, say, uh, your grandchild. Okay. Uh, yeah. oh, I just wanted to add an idea for the game interface itself. Do you see it being like a web app or? Uh... Uh, yeah, so it's going to be, we're still deciding if it should be a desktop app or a web app. So we know that the way the back end will work, but I'm just trying to uh, decide if I should do it from like a Java framework, so access it uh, from like a desktop app or a web app, which is probably going to be in solely determined by the ease of me using a Java applet to access non-volatile memory on the desk, which I've done before, which that would be easy for the web app, yeah. Is that about the effectiveness of where you're placing your sensors and how you're measuring the actual posture? Does the belt have kind of low thing posture? Right. So um, we we originally considered uh, the hat as one of our uh, one of our first options, I think. But then the belt was also an option. Um, we actually considered the fact that it was a lower down, um, but maybe combine uh, a combination of the belt and uh, jacket or hat could uh, also uh, increase the accuracy of our posture detection. So that's why we incorporated it in our designs. We're definitely able to both in a combination thereof. And, um, we put ourselves in a position now where we're posture, cheat, user tests, all combinations thereof. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Power to the people. Ready? Go. Hi everyone, my name is Vincent and I'm a senior in mechanical engineering and today I'll be talking about my project Power to the People. So to begin, I'm going to do a quick background on my project. Uh, my grandmother, along with a large portion of older adults, experienced varying degrees of arthritis. In my grandmother's case, due to her working long hours for 60 years, it just left her finger, fingers bent and crippled. Yet, she's still full of life and loves to do things that she once did when she was younger. Among these activities is cooking. 
My grandmother loves to cook, but because of the severity of her arthritis, she is unable to open jars and cartons to use milk, chew, sauce, and other uh, cooking ingredients. Yet this, uh, yet this problem extends to more than just my grandmother. In order to fully grasp the scope of the situation, I did a little research on the CDC website and was able to find some startling figures. According to the CDC, approximately 49.7% of adults 65 years or older reported arthritis diagnosis. Uh, specifically, an estimated 1.5 million adults had rheumatoid arthritis in 2007. Granted, these uh, statistics are about eight years old, yet it's still clear that arthritis is a problem that many experience or will experience at one point in their lives. Uh, after deciding on a specific problem, I then uh, looked at the design criteria that I would be using to address the set problem. What I came up with was as follows. The device must be able to be operated by my grandmother and others with severe arthritis by themselves, be able to be used on lids of various sizes, such as pasta lids, sauce lids, and milk carton lids, provide a way to open even the most difficult of lids without requiring the user to um, exert any more force than normal, be small, portable, and inexpensive to be used in various kitchens. Uh, with both a problem and a design criteria in mind, next step was to go out and do some introductory interviews on my target users. Uh, one of my goals in pursuing this project was to create a tool that can not only benefit my grandmother, but others with, maybe, with less severe forms of arthritis. Um, in order to do this, I decided to interview three participants. First up is my grandmother. And so here's a picture of my grandmother's fingers um, to show the severity of her arthritis um, because of uh, she, so my grandmother is 75 years old. Um, she spent 60 years working in fields and factories. Um, and even after retirement, she still continued raising her nine grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Um, but, but she still enjoys cooking, and she cooks three meals a day, seven days a week, um, especially on holidays where she heads the Thanksgiving and Christmas cooking. Um, but she's unable to grasp anything with any real power. She can't open jars unless someone's there to open it with her. And even if the jar is pre-opened, she can't, sometimes can't even open those. Um, the second person I decided to interview was my own father, who is 44 years old. Um, and this is a picture of his hands. He has the onset of uh, less severe arthritis. And so I decided to get someone with the, uh, that form of arthritis as opposed to my grandmother's. Uh, my father grew up playing sports. He loved basketball and baseball. Um, he also works on a computer eight plus hours a day. And because of this, he's now in the uh, beginning forms of arthritis. Um, as for my father, he can open uh, many jars. Um, he can open lids with relative ease. Um, there's a couple of jars where he maybe needs to use a rag or a gripper to get it open. Um, and in these cases, he does it fairly easily, but with, sometimes with notable, noticeable effort. And as for my, the third person I interviewed, it was myself. Uh, I'm 22 years old and in relatively good physical condition. Um, I have no problems with my hands. I mean, I take good notes, so, and I play a lot of video games, so sometimes my hands are kind of messed up. But I have no trouble opening lids. Um, occasionally, a difficult lid will pop up, and I'll just grab a rag and open it with, uh, with ease. Um, but I did find that when I do use the uh, rags that they have, um, it feels like I'm wasting a lot of power. And so this was something I wanted to fix. And so I, next, the next step I took was to go out and see what they actually had out there. And the, this is a couple of um, products that I found that attempted to solve the solution, but each one comes with its own problems that didn't fit the criteria I set for myself. Uh, this one right here is an automatic opener. Um, the only problem with this is it's really expensive. It retails for $250 and I didn't want something like that. Um, the next one is this, uh, this device. Uh, one of the biggest problems with this one is that you need uh, to use a lot of gripping to uh, get a tight seal on the lid. Uh, next up are these two, um, where you have to wedge it in, and I didn't like that you gotta provide a lot of force to really get a good uh, grip on it, as well as this one being um, non-portable. And then these are the grip rags, but those are better suited for people who need a little bit of assistance. Um, and then, so when I came, after looking at all the products that were out there, I next went to uh, ID80 and finding out solutions. So I talked to a bunch of people, a bunch of friends, and I was able to condense all ideas they gave me into four different categories. Um, friction, pressure, force, and heat. Uh, these were the four different categories to solve these. And so I picked four ideas 
out of those four areas to uh, make quick sketches of. As for pressure, uh, one of the ideas that I did like was a sort of pressure cooker uh, where you simply put the jar into a um, vacuum sealed container and then uh, increase or decrease the pressure to get a pressure difference that would pop off the lid. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's very feasible and I doubt that it would actually do anything. Um, so I next moved on to force. And one of the ideas that a friend gave me was a guillotine of sorts, where you drop something heavy or drop a chisel onto a lid, which would then pop it off. Um, but this presented safety concerns, and I decided not to go with that. And last was heat, where uh, the idea was to heat up a rag um, to get it nice and warm, so that when you uh, <coughs> attempt to use it on the lid, it would cause it to expand and then pop off pretty easy. Only problem with that was, one of the big problems with that was that it required a separate heater and I wanted this to be portable and easy to move around uh, from households. And so what I came up with, so uh, the area I decided to end up uh, going forward with was friction. And so uh, the first uh, design that I came up with was this kind of U-shaped grabber. Um, and so what it would entail would be uh, allowing the user to extend and retract the handle in order to get more torque on the lid, as well as um, these are little holes where you'd strap a band of sorts, and that would allow you to adjust the band so that you could get grip on, I mean, big jars, little jars, any type of lids that you can. And so here's a more in-depth look. Uh, here's the uh, one hand bar going in and out that could be retractable and here's where the uh, band would be looped. And so the materials that I decided to use for this uh, design would be uh, Dyson for the strap um, as well as a sort of plastic for the uh, actual handle. Um, I decided that I want to try to 3D print it, uh, at least the 3D print the um, prototypes to see if uh, it does in fact uh, work like work as expected. Um, there was a couple difficulties that I experienced that I faced in terms of making sure that the material is strong enough that it won't bend or break when pushed. Um, as for the cost, I'm hoping to keep it under $30 per tool, uh, so that's nice and cheap. Um, and safety considerations, want to use plastic instead of metal so that there's no chance of being cut or hurt. And so next up is to just go in and actually 3D print it. I have the SolidWorks files ready, and then I'll start really te uh, stress testing it to see if I need to make any uh, adjustments. I already found out that the band needs to be strengthened so that it doesn't snap. And yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, I have a first question. Uh, you know, it seems to me that opening a uh, jar requires you know, two actions. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to either hold it or have it held uh, uh, firm on the bottom, then you need you know, torque over here, so you need grip and torque. So how does your design take care of both of those? Uh, so it provides the torque, and uh, what I was thinking right now was making a secondary, not the same device as before, but a uh, kind of like an oven mitt uh, that would be coated in Dyson or Dicom. And then you would hold Dyson, and you would hold that at the bottom of the jar, the bottom of the lid. <coughs> I believe that that should have enough stability to where a little bit of uh, force on the handle should. Uh, okay, can, can you test that? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was gonna. I was planning on testing that, and uh, if necessary, I have a couple other ideas to get that thing nice and steady. Anybody else question? John, did you find the metric on how much force is needed? Uh, so it depends on the jar. Um, I bought like three jars, and I mean, it's hard to do it because of me personally, it's like I found out how hard I have to do it. Um, but I'm planning on going. I'm going home this actual weekend uh, to really test out to see how my grandma, how much force my grandma could put on there. Put the scale or something in it. Yeah. Um, I don't remember Dyson being um, electrically elastic at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> is, is there any consideration of maybe having as part of your uh, design a, uh, a rubber band component that would allow for, for elasticity, or, or do you just need to manually make tight fit for you? So, uh, yeah, the Dyson 
is I, I was actually I actually tried it and it snapped when I tried pulling it. Um, so I'm gonna have to uh, reinforce that with maybe another band. Um, but my what I was thinking was to make it uh, adjustable by hand, so it would, it's not gonna be elastic, more just hand adjustable. Thanks. Thanks so much. Triple tray is next. <clears throat> teaching, basically what they do is create these innovative, hands-on design kits that allow for alternative subjects to be taught in schools, also the basic subjects that we all know and love, but also different things, unique things. And so what they usually want and what they always expect and strive for is to create these new multi-subject area design kits in order to improve teaching. And so our, um, our goal for this class specifically was to create a new kit that would accommodate um, students with disabilities and be all inclusive and allowing teachers to be able to displace the students with disabilities. And so the problem statement is basically currently teachers of students with disabilities have a limited amount of resources. There's little to no affordable ways to really teach or rather ultimately teach students with disabilities. And so what we want to do is design an educational design kit that is accessible to these students with disabilities and therefore allow them to engage in learning, teamwork, and creative thinking. And so just to give you guys a better scope of the problem at hand, is that there are many different ways that students can have, students with disabilities have issues with uh, motor control. And that's the type of um, problem that we want to address in this design. And so just to give you guys a quick um, example, some statistics, about 0.14% um, to 0.4% of children are born with cerebral palsy. 1.47% uh, of children are identified with autism spectrum disorder. And 11% of children have been diagnosed with ADHD. And so we want to address students with disabilities concerning motor control and attention. And so to kind of uh, move our uh, project along, we interviewed a few people. Greg Brown, who is the director at RAF, he's the one that really conveyed to us the goals of RAF. And so that's the type of mentality we embody, which is to create these the, the, like design kits that are innovative and allow teachers to kind of build upon their classroom. Also, we interviewed Eve, who is a tutor at Bum Young. She really grounded our, our project expectations, really made sure that what we wanted was realistic. Because initially, we wanted something that would really, really push engineering and design for these students. But the reality was, this might be out of the scope of what these students are capable of. So we want to make something that is within reason and therefore also allowing them to improve on these things. Also, we interviewed Amy, who is a teacher at Paula Alton Unified. She really emphasized that we need to touch on like the basic engineering concepts and the physics concepts. If we want to teach something like that, we need to make sure we're touching on the basic ones, not so much the theoretical ones, but the hyper like complex, and just really emphasizing things like gravity to some simple um, practical concepts that people can like, see. And lastly, we interviewed Agnes, who is a math instructor at Brown Middle School, and she emphasized the importance of taking into account the teacher, making sure we create a kit that can be utilized by the teacher, easily taught, and manageable. So after conducting these interviews, we learned that current lesson plans are sometimes unable to accommodate children with disabilities. So our goal is to create a unique and targeted lesson plan that's going to help develop daily living skills for these children with disabilities. And our main focus is going to be children with uh, disabilities that affect motor control. So some existing RAF kits, as you guys saw earlier from the other group, include an egg drop kit, a survival design kit where students use everyday materials to uh, create tools that will help them survive like, the wild or on a stranded island, an earthquake simulation tool made of popsicle sticks. We also have a solar cooker there and a car that runs by even the one the road dance. However, these graph design kits, even though they emphasize some sort of engineering concept, there isn't really a therapeutic uh, component to it, which is where we come in. We want to integrate therapy and education together. So 
So some of our design concepts include creating a design that's going to encourage critical thinking skills to build something. That would be something similar to the survival design kit or the ink drop kit. Or we can create a, to a toy that teaches an engineering principle that's similar to the car with the rubber bands. Lastly, we thought about creating some sort of game that enforces using design thinking to come up with a solution. So some design alternatives include a game that teaches about fluids and viscosity. And we came up with that idea because we know that rafting has a lot of materials that float, so we were thinking maybe we teach about like buoyancy or integrate water somehow. We thought about coming up with a catapult design challenge where we gave the students like possible stick rubber bands and they can create those catapults. We also came up with the idea of using a tool that develops motor skills by emphasizing line tracing. And that's because we think that line tracing will help these students with handwriting, <coughs> So the top design concepts that we chose um, was uh, primarily a game. Um, so our focus is to create something, or our focus has been to create a game that integrates, again, as Jeannie said, a therapy component as well as a um, game, into, like a, a teaching component for, the, for um, instructors and for students as well. Um, so the game that we have come up with is a two-phase game that um, the first phase has a specific emphasis on um, various components such as mathematical optimization, and I know that may sound very high level, but integrating kind of like more complexity with um, the point system, so having students um, calculate their points based on, instead of just counting the numbers, um, the different colors having different values, and it's the sum of those colors and the sum of those quarks together, as you can see here, that leads to their final score. And it allows for the teacher to kind of have the, the teaching component being able to explain how this goes about. Um, the second is um, the idea of teamwork. Um, as the other group mentioned, uh, Greg was really, really big on the idea of collaboration. And we felt that that was also something very important um, that our game incorporated. And then lastly, pr um, promotes learning through trial and error. We want students to feel accomplished at the end of the day or at the end of the exercise that they're doing. And um, one thing to, to emphasize, as you see with the course, there's going to be, you know, the instructions that we have implemented will emphasize um, different limitations that students have to follow that encourage them to extension and flexion and not just grabbing or possibly grabbing one cork at a time for one phase or grabbing a handful of corks at, at a time. So we're kind of fleshing those ideas out, but again, uh, implementing the therapy and um, the, uh, the teaching. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip here and come back to that slide. Um, so this is our first phase of the design. Um, as you see, there are different color corks, and each one will correspond to different points and, their, and uh, different difficulties in being able to stick it in these slots, which again is encouraging kind of the tactile integration um, and increasing like motor skills with these students. Um, and then the second phase is the building of a tower, and each level will have various um, <coughs> limitations or stipulations that students have to follow. So the base has to have this many corks, the top, the, the second one this, this many, and then the third one, so on and so forth. And the idea is that each level or each kind of challenge integrates a moment for a teacher to be able to teach something along, along, along the lines of balance, torques, and moments, or whatever, again, for that teaching component. And then to go back to this is kind of the a visual of it, of real-time conflicts. And then finally, future work and challenges is to, to develop the design and then test it with students and with educators, finalize the rules, um, again, making sure that we integrate the idea of um, you know, therapy and teaching, and then finally, construct an instructional video for teachers so that they know the value of each of the steps of our game for their students. Thank you. Explain a little bit more how you're, you're uh, planning to do that. So um, one of the things that we were doing, I mean, part of it is is one of the limitations I think that we found is like being uh, individuals that don't have issues with mobility, it was hard sometimes to find out what was too difficult and what wasn't difficult. So we started critically analyzing the movements that we were doing when we were using those tools. And one of the things that Jeannie did that piqued like our interest was she grabbed the the, the corks with one hand and grab a bunch of 
much fun. I said we'd stop there. I was like that that would probably be something very difficult. So we wanted to integrate the things that we took for granted as being easy mm -hmm. and, and integrate that in. Yeah, and Eve was the one we talked to who like really emphasized you guys should not just design something that teaches engineering. You want to add some therapy into it as where you're actually helping these students improve their role skills, not just like look at something and learn some engineering concept. Thanks. Do you envision um, the, the students or teams of students being students with disabilities entirely or like what kind of issue? Yeah, um, the, because you're, as you guys probably know as well, it's like really difficult to choose when you say students with disabilities because like yeah. it's, it's, it's so difficult to like create one game that bridges the gap between various limitations. So the idea is like to focus on motor skills, um, but the game not necessarily being limited in that regards to students. Okay. When you guys uh, listen to Graf when you had a lot of different sound plans already, um, did you guys notice any sense of pattern of what's really successful in those kids and you guys were going to also build up what you want to create? I think like one of the most successful things we noticed was like the aspect of teamwork. Um, Greg had us uh, go through one of his sample um, games that he just came up with, which was like there was a cone, a large cone center, four cones on the side, and you couldn't step into the cone, but you had to use the string to get a small ring onto the top of the cone. And it was just the idea of like we messed up the first time, and then it was just and then we all laughed, we learned something, and then we got it right the next time. So that aspect of teamwork, learning from like failure, and like. That type of iterative process, iterative process was really unique to Graph, and I think something I want to, we want to emphasize in this project. Okay, let's move on. I've actually oh, got enough questions. Little um, after. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. That was really great. Dukes of Hazard. Tom and Stuart while working on it. So we're going to talk to you today about what, what the issue, the perceived issue is with the current hand controls and why we're choosing to fix them. Uh, the goals after examining the current uh, products on the market, the goals that we have for redesigning it, our design ideas, and then the prototype as it stands today. So I'm going to show you some pictures. This is me. This is my car. It's a little confusing in that I have hand controls permanently installed on my car. Uh, but for the most part, you can still put uh, temporary hand controls. But regardless, this is the process that I or any other hand control user has to go through to put temporary hand controls on the car. So you can see I have to kneel down in the parking lot, stick my head and my hands into the footwell, and get my hands around the pedals to clamp everything on. So what you can see there is the temporary hand control, the, the foot, the clamp of it going on in the pedal. Pretty, pretty simple, except I have to contort myself to get down there and install it. Um, once it's installed in the car, I can hop in and then install the second stage, which is the actual hand control that I interface with. So I have, I have to first clamp the pedals themselves, and then I have to attach the handle up at the top. At least when I'm doing that, I can sit in the driver's seat, which means that I can be out of the rain if it's raining or off the asphalt of the pavement. Right, so we timed him while he was doing this, and it took about five minutes to clamp the hand controls to the pedals. And while he's doing this, he's kneeling on the ground outside the car. And then he gets into the car and strap it around the steering column, takes an additional three minutes. It takes about one and a half minutes to disassemble. And these are times for someone who's done this many times. Uh, so you can imagine that the times are only going to increase for someone who has an, either doesn't have as good of motor skill or hasn't ever done this before. So the problems with the hand controls right now, the main ones, are the fact that he has to kneel outside of the car, which is far from ideal. If it's raining or the floor is dirty, I mean, you don't really want to be down there having to assemble this for five minutes. 
And additionally, it's not really universal design. Now, Dan hasn't driven that many cars, but he already knows for a fact it doesn't work on golf carts because it has a hinge on the brake. And additionally, it doesn't work on the Audi R8, which is just you know, one of many models. And uh, the reason for this being not that it doesn't really attach to the pedals, but the pedals have a lever that come from the ground rather than standing down. So there's concern that the hand controls will slip off. So you can imagine that other cars that might have similar design, they might not work for that either. So what we want to do to improve the hand controls are first, lower the time. Five minutes isn't a huge amount of time, but we have these right here, which are a simple claw mechanism, and you can imagine you can just put them on really quick. So we think that it should be entirely possible to reduce five minutes to like 30 seconds. Um, also, you don't want the person to have to get out of the car and kneel down. For starters, not everyone's even going to be able to do this. Dan's fortunate enough to have prosthetic legs to be able to do that, but if someone's in a wheelchair, they're not even able to reach the pedals. Uh, so we'd like them to be seated in the car and just be able to uh, tighten the, the hand controls from their seated position. And we want a universal design so you don't have to worry about going somewhere, renting a car, and finding out your hand controls don't work. Additionally, we have some secondary objectives. Um, Dan likes to travel, so he uh, likes the collapsibility of the design. And we want to maintain that so you can easily pack it up in your luggage. It doesn't take too much room. And we would prefer that it doesn't require fine motor, school, motor skills so anyone can use it. Uh, but we're running with some issues with that, so we're going to try our best. So, kind of going into the design ideas. Um, building off of those uh, objectives that we had, we wanted something that would incorporate all those design tech uh, kind of uh, parts. So we liked this uh, grabbing mechanism. It was fast and easy. We wanted something that was fast and easy. And then we also wanted something that still uh, maintained this one-handed driving uh, ability. So building off of these two uh, ideas that are already in the market, we came up with our own idea, which was kind of a looping mechanism that would quickly grab and uh, contain the pedal while still maintaining this maneuver. <coughs> Head with this right away was okay. This is a great idea, but how are we going to keep it tension? How are we going to keep this force supply on the pedal? Um, we were able to find this handy dandy little tensioner. Um, it will still give us the mechanical advantage for people who have dexterity issues. Uh, they'll still be able to get it really tight, and it'll be really easy to release as well. So, to kind of test out this idea, we went to our first really quick inversion prototype. Here, you can kind of see how there's this looping part that will go out grab the pedal and then pull tight. Um, the tensioner will be up here and it still interfaces with the pedal really nicely. We get a uh, universal design. And so we really like this idea and wanted to move forward with it. Going on there, we uh, came up with this idea where we still have the few degrees of freedom on the pedal so that we're allowed to use the one-handed control. The problem with this was that once we started to uh, exhibit a force around these end, uh, these rod ends, is there gets to be a moment, so it goes contact like this. So this was another problem with our design that we needed to get around, kind of once we had the tension on the hand controls, and that kind of leads us into the next part of our design, where we start building this out a little bit more robustly. Um, we tried to model it off of these uh, hand controls that we already have, maintain the similar size and similar length. And uh, Tom will go into how we incorporate these rods onto this. Yeah, so this is um, kind of a picture of our second prototype where we actually tried it out on a car just to make sure that this part here wasn't going to, um, which one is the? It's OK. We had a short little video, but. Uh, we were able to test this out and make sure that when we got tension on the cable there, it wasn't going to come off the brake. Because obviously that would be super dangerous and something you don't want to have happen when you're driving. Um, was... okay. We just had a short video of it, yeah. but it's, uh, it's still a pretty rough prototype. So moving forward, we have two ideas. Our best idea currently is to hopefully mount the tensioner um, device somewhere on this main tube. Um, and fix that problem that Stuart talked about of the cockeyedness and hopefully we're able to do that. But if we aren't, we also have a second idea that we came up with which is to mount the tensioner right here on the second pole. And this isn't the most ideal because you would lose a little bit in collapsibility but uh, it would get rid of the problem of the moment and the forces and it would just be easier to 
uh, easier to attach. So we want to get our tensioner mechanism mounted on our prototypes and test them out. And then just refine it so we don't have cables hanging everywhere and kind of make the design a little bit cleaner before the end of the quarter. And then also um, add die cam to the uh, bottom of the foot there so that it doesn't slip off the pedal as easy. And we hope that um, with the current design right now that we have and what we want to do going forward in the quarter that we can achieve all the design goals that we set out in the beginning by the end of the quarter. So that's where we are right now. And uh, this is some of our um, second prototype that we had built uh, actually two days ago. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah, it's a yeah. primary consideration. I mean, I need these hand controls to drive, but I recognize that I also have a lot of flexibility that other disabled people, other hand controlled users might not have. Like, if I have to, I can get down on my knees in a parking lot and crawl underneath uh, the car and inside. Um, so that's a big priority. The, the current hand controls, as they are, are really fine in terms of use. It's just they're not easy to put on or take off. And so that's the real primary thing we're trying to solve. And we think that we can actually get it so that a user, as long as a user is capable of sitting in a driver's seat and operating hand controls, we think that's all the ability we need to install the hand controls. So that's the real goal of the project. We didn't touch on this, but um, one of the design uh, components that's making it difficult to get around this uh, uh, motion issue is that we're trying to bring it up on to the, the control shaft, sort of, so that it can be put on from the chair rather than getting down on it. Um, two factors I want to address in that is usually, for example, in my demographic, mm -hmm. in this demographic, not being able to squat down, kneel down, and get underneath the, the column of the car is the delay time for me to find somebody. Yeah. Um, secondly, is the wait time for that addressing it and installing it into the car. So that means my scheduling is compromised. Yeah, we think if this turns out the way we want it to, we don't think you'll have any of those issues anymore. You'll just do it all yourself. Are there, are there regulatory bodies that don't have them? We haven't looked into that yet. I can't imagine so. It's kind of odd. I buy all my stuff off the internet. I just Google it and there are always little mom and pop shops. And there's certainly nothing about the car that I drive was installed by a licensed mechanic that was paid for by the VA, and I trust the VA generally. But I thought about it the other day. Uh, I'm pretty sure if I get in a hardcore front end accident, I'm gonna have some just straight metal rods going right into my abdomen. Um, so I try not to crash. <laughs> I mean, the, the car certainly was, I know, the steer, I know the steering column will collapse and the firewall and the engine will all absorb the impact. It's designed that way, but like my car was not crash tested with these three metal rods <laughs> bolted onto it, so I don't know. We're going to try to develop some uh, uh, metrics around that as well to make sure that we're, we're not we're thinking of having that. explosive charges. <laughs> <laughs> so that when a crash occurs, it actually self-destructs in the safe. <laughs> That's phase three. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, guys. junior mechanical engineer student here. Um, I'm doing a solo group project called the Magical Bridge Project. Um, so for the next five minutes I'll be introducing you to my uh, um, 3D map that I'll be making in collaboration with the Magical Bridge Playground. Um, as you may remember the Magical Bridge Playground is a is a playground for children, uh, is an all-inclusive playground, and by all-inclusive I mean children of all abilities can come and play in this park and have a great time. Um, and part of that means that this park also must be navigable by all children and all, uh, uh, be that if you're visually impaired or blind. Um, this is where I come in. Um, Alenka uh, Villarreal uh, has asked for me to build a 3D tactile map for the park that will be put it at the entryway of the park. Um, the map will give a layout uh, of the park to the children 
um, before they venture in and have a, have a good time. Um, having discussed with Olenka, uh, I think we've kept, come up with two primary goals, um, and that is that the map must be able to be read tactily, um, could be touched and feel and um, read what's on the map, um, be that braille, other etchings or something, um, and it also must be attractive to stand alone uh, on its own in the front of the park. Okay, uh, so currently the park has this map, um, and you might recognize it. Um, it's posted throughout uh, in cropped and laminated versions. Uh, the problem is uh, it's 2D and it's not tactile, so anybody that comes up to it who is visually impaired can't read it. Um, and also it's out of date. Um, some of the structures are misplaced and um, stuff like that. Um, uh, with, the, with the magical uh, bridge pr uh, program, need, uh, magical bridge playground needs is a large map at the very end, at the front entrance of the park um, that can give children um, an idea of what the park's laid out, so they can have a safe, fun time throughout the rest of the day. Um, okay, design beginnings. Uh, here's some scans from my logbook of the uh, brainstorming process and the selection process. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to make uh, think of. Basically, any material that, I, that could um, potentially be made into a map, um, a 3D map. Um, and some of the ideas which I like the most are uh, layered acrylic or wood, um, formed plastic over foam, or uh, clay and ceramics. Um, from my previous experience with clays and ceramics, it's just really hard to come up with a finished product that looks good in any reasonable amount of time. Um, and then. The, other, the issue with the form of plastic is on the other scale is that uh, it seems really interesting and it could come up with a finished product pretty easily. It's just the machines in the shop are a little bit uh, um, complicated and I don't think it's going to be something that I can really take up and master in the time scale. Um, so I finally decided on is doing some laser cut uh, layering of wood or acrylic. Almost will likely be using acrylic for this. Um, and so to best visualize what I'm thinking here, um, it'd be a combination of these two photos. Um, I would use like the topographical um, setup of that image uh, to portray the landscape of the park and also to uh, mark out the zones and the features of the park. And then I would also use some sort of like etching like this of the pathways of the park to give a route to the children, um, show like what's like where the pathways are basically and where are the boundaries and what what's, what you can and can't do. Um, Luckily, uh, laser cutting isn't that difficult uh, to produce a final product. You just need a uh, digital file and then um, time to go in and cut it out and then assemble it. Um, and cost is uh, not going to be that big of an issue because I will only need to be buying a few sheets of acrylic and um, I won't be at buying a lot of little nitpicky specialty, specialty parts. It's all going to be made out of acrylic and glue. Um, um, and the map will have letters on it, uh, which I haven't quite established what I'm going to be doing for that. Um, I could either cut out or use Braille uh, stickers, um, but we'll, that's one design project, project that's going to come up. Um, and ideally, kids will be rubbing hands all over this, this map, so the edges need to be clear burrs and sharp pieces um, to ensure safety. Um, I don't know if this is interesting to you all, but I have some prototypes. I just did some practice cuts to make sure that I was knew what I was doing in the PRL, um, practiced some lettering here on the bottom and gluing some acrylic just to see how strong the glue was. Um, so uh, looking forward, uh, so I'm almost finished with the Illustrator file um, to cut out the, cut the map out. Here's a photo of it, um, of my represent representation of the park. Obviously some of the things are simplified down, um, but as you can see, so like, oop, as you can see, this would be one layer, would be the path, this would be the bottom layer, and then these would be all, like, all stacked up on top of each other, giving it like a three-dimensional feel. Um, looking forward, I still need to figure out what I'll be doing with the lettering, um, and that requires me talking to some visually impaired people, seeing like in the in their past like what's been easiest to read and understand. Um, I need to finalize a time, time scale for the project, because Alenka is also hoping that I can finish this for the uh, opening of the park, which would be really, really interesting if I could match them up with the project. Um, and that's about it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yeah? How big is this going to be? So I'm planning on doing it in the PRL laser cutters, and those are 
tw uh, two feet by four feet at uh, max scale, which is probably going to be two by three or something like that. Um, will it be height adjustable? Um, I, I'm thinking right now it's going to be at a pretty low height just to accommodate children and then people in wheelchairs. Um, but uh, I'm thinking it might be more permanent and not quite as a, like be on a pedestal of some sort. Yeah? Do you have different materials in the same topo map to show up so kid can like trace a path and no light touch or like running areas, swing areas, stuff like that? Uh, like an, an, an interactive feature of it? Yeah, well, yeah, just like build it out different materials so that as long as I feel this one material, yeah, that yeah. means that it's a pathway. And that would, yeah, that would be, we're right. adding some texturizations to it. Yeah, yeah I like that idea. Um, I'm trying to just right now focusing on keeping like um, the levels straight, like in terms of this, this level will be on a different level than that level if there's a curve in between them. So like, um, just to like mark out where you can go. But I like that idea, thank you. Um, why did you decide not to 3D print different components and put it together? Um, so similar to the forming, uh, I didn't, uh, I don't have any experience with 3D printing, but, um, and also in the past, I just don't think, uh, like the way that the 3D printed product looks with the lines and stuff, I didn't really think it would be quite as, uh, you know, finished without like an extra layer of finishing process on top of it. It was just consideration. I remember when we were on the trip, there was going to be some water outlets in the park. Water outlets? You know, fountains or anything like that? I don't think so. I, I, uh, there's, there's like natural elements in terms of greenery and obviously there, but in terms of like fountains, I'm not, I don't think so. It might be. I'd have to double check. Uh, yeah. Are you planning to cluster it out of acrylic right away or are you going like, to do something with cardboard first? Yeah, that's uh, one thing I also liked about the 3D cutting would be that I can make a prototype really quickly with cardboard just to make sure it all looks right and kind of has a natural feel to it. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, if I can, I don't, like the color supplies, I've, I've done a little bit looking into the colored acrylics and it doesn't really quite seem like uh, I can get like a nice scheme of colors all from one supplier, so it might, like, I, I wouldn't want like a neon green with like a toned down navy blue or whatever, but if I can get the supplies, I'll definitely try and make it color coded. Tap plastics. Tap plastics, there we go. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, Eric and I want to thank all of you. Thanks for sticking around, and if you haven't saw the intensive sheet, uh, please do. If you feel you've uh, made a good evaluation of people and you deserve another cookie, here you go.